Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The lecture tonight is a lecture on poultices. And the question arises, what is a poultice? A poultice is vegetable matter put into a little parcel and put on something like a boil or a sprained ankle or a congested chest. And often the waste is pulled away through the skin. Whereas a compress is applied to a congested area and often the, the body breaks it up and it's taken away through the bloodstream. So what I'm going to do in this lecture tonight is I'm going to be demonstrating some poultices that you can use in your home for, for all sorts of ailments. And the things that I'm using are things that most people have in their home. The first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the onion. And I'm very grateful to the onion because it was my first poultice that I ever did. And it was done on my son James when he got an earache. I was very disillusioned with uh, treating my children medically because my first child got an earache and six weeks later and four lots of antibiotics later she still had the earache. So when my son James had, the, had an earache two years later I decided not to go to the doctor. I decided to go to the old lady next door and I said what did your mother do when you had an earache? I was 25, she was 85. She said mum would steam up an onion on the stove. She said keep the skin intact and you steam it or you dry bake. You don't boil it because some of the healing properties will go into the water. So you steam it till it's soft. So let's pretend that I have steamed this and it's hot. So at this stage we're looking at the onion cooked and where you can use it cooked. And then you cut it in half. And you cut it in half across ways, so you're looking at the rings. Now this is very hot and you can squeeze that, that cooked onion juice into a teaspoon. It's boiling hot but the teaspoon of course is cold and then you can put that into the ear. You would never put raw onion juice in the ear but remember we're pretending this is cooked but the cooked you can. And then what I did with my little boy James I got a, a hand towel and I wrapped up the onion and I wrapped it up with a couple of layers so I could still feel the heat but it wasn't too hot and then I put it on his ear and I put the towel over like this to insulate. If you can keep that poultice hot you can use it longer. If the poultice gets cold you really have to take it off. Now my little boy James fell asleep with the onion on his ear and I laid him down in the bed with his head on the onion with the towel insulating it and he slept for two hours. And when he woke up he was happy. <laughs> I was impressed. So at the age of 25 this was my very first poultice and I began a journey then, a journey that has never disappointed me. I raised my six children and then two more children, eight children, and we never had to use drugs. I found the natural treatments always brought relief. So that's where you can use an onion. You can use it on an earache and you always use it cooked. How long do you need to have it on for? As long as you can keep it warm. You might keep it on half an hour, you might keep it on a couple of hours, especially if the person goes to sleep with it all insulated, maybe in a big thick towel. You might put it on the ear wrapped in a cloth and put some plastic on or a beanie on or a thick headband on but as long as you can keep it warm. A friend of mine needed to do it every day twice a day for a week whereas with my son James I only had to apply it once. Your body will tell you. If you apply the young impultus get relief and you will and maybe it hurts again that evening, you do it again. You just keep doing it. Remember that the body knows what to do. The body knows how to heal itself and the body will tell you. What you can also use a cooked onion for is for a boil. And for a boil, you could basically cook it and when it gets to the right temperature, just place the whole thing on the boil. Maybe cover it with a square of plastic and bandage it on. The plastic keeps it hot. It's not actually really touching the skin so it's not really a problem and then you bandage that on. Cooked onion you use basically for the two areas I told you. Now we're going to have a look at raw onion. 
Raw onion can be used for all respiratory problems. What happens when you chop up an onion? You start to cry? That's because the onion juice starts to loosen all the fluids in the eustachian tube. So if you have a blocked sinus, if you have um, blocked respiratory, the onion can clear it. And with a baby, you can finally slice an onion and put it on a plate and put it near on a bedside table, say near where the baby's sleeping and the baby will breathe in the onion fumes. Most people are aware that if you paint a room and the fumes are strong, you can slice up an onion and put it in the room and it'll absorb the paint fumes. Or if there's a bad smell in the fridge, you can slice up the onion and, and put it in. But as a result, because the onion is a drawer, you would never wrap, you would never use half an onion and wrap the other half in glad wrap because the onion will absorb all the chemicals from the glad wrap. If you, if you have an onion and you only want to use half, you could chop it in half with the skin intact and you could put one half in a china bowl like that. But I would not keep that till the next day. You might keep it for the next meal, but not for the next day. What you can do if you've only got a big onion, you only want to use a little and you're not going to use an onion again till the next day, you might chop the whole onion up finely, put it into a glass jar with a metal lid and put it in the freezer. And I have done that because the onion is a drawer and that's why it works with, with the earache and the boil. But let's have a look at raw onion that you can use as a poultice. You can use a raw onion as a poultice for all respiratory problems. And to use it as a poultice, you finely slice it. I don't usually grate because when you grate it, it becomes very, very wet. So you finely slice the onion and then you might use a chucks or a cloth. I'm using a chucks. And you put the onion into the cloth or the chucks and you spread it around, break it up a little bit, and you fold it over. And that's how you make your poultice. So here's your onion poultice, and that would be about the size for maybe a 10-year-old child. And the area that's got one layer, that's the area that you would put on the chest. I've got a microphone there, so I'm not going to put it on my chest, but I'll let you imagine. And then you cover it with plastic, um, let's pretend that that is my chest. <laughs> so I would put it like that. And then, and then you would bandage it on or tape it on. If I was putting that on my six-year-old, I would put the four-year-old singlet on it. And the singlet will hold it snug and you could even pin it through all that into the singlet and that can hold it. And then I might put a skivvy on and then maybe a, a firm-fitting woolly jumper. How long would you leave it on for? You would leave it on for several hours. Because the onion, if it's on too long, can irritate the skin. I probably, it's not an, a poultice maybe that I would use overnight. I might use it for several hours in the evening or I might use it for several hours in the morning. You would never use the poultice twice because that onion will absorb a lot of waste and you want to discard it. Making it into a poultice is just really easy to discard. Then you don't get bits of onion falling all through the clothes either. Obviously, for an older person, you would make it a little bit bigger. You can also use it for a sore throat. For a sore throat, you would pull the onions out a little bit longer and you would fold it over like this. And then you would want the poultice to be from ear to ear. So it would be around like that. When you put it on, then you would cover it with glad wrap and then a scarf and pin it on. You could even go to work with your onion poultice on and no one will know. They might ask you about your perfume. <laughs> you might leave it on for several hours, just as long as your body's happy with it, but you will be surprised at how it takes the edge off a sore throat. I was travelling recently, oh, it was probably a couple of years ago now actually, and I was lecturing all week and I had 10 flights in the week and near the end of the week I got a very sore throat. So I chopped up the onion, made the poultice and put it on and it certainly took the edge off. But the next day when my throat was sore again, I didn't want to put the onion on because my skin was getting a little tender. <clears throat> so I'll give you a simple treatment, it's called a heating compress. Because I was travelling I got a sock, 
I wet the sock, rang it out, and I wrapped the wet sock around my throat. I had a plastic bag in my bag, so I wrapped the plastic bag around my neck, and then I put a scarf around my neck, and I pinned that together. That's a heating compress. People say, do you do it warm? No, you do it cold, because even if you do it warm, by the time you wring it out and pull it out, the air will cool it. But as soon as that plastic goes on your throat over the, over the wet sock, it warms it up. You can go to bed with that overnight. You'll be amazed at how it takes the edge off a sore throat. It basically builds up a little steam bath around your neck and brings the blood to that area. And remember, your blood's the healer. Brings more nourishment, more white blood cell, takes away the waste. And of course, that one you can just keep doing again and again. Very simple treatment is the heating compress. Another thing you can do with the onion is make an onion syrup. I'm not going to demonstrate this. I'm just going to give you an idea on how you do it. What you do is you cut your onion up into small pieces and you put that into a jar. So just imagine that's in the bottom of a jar and then a teaspoon of honey then another layer of chopped onion, then another teaspoon of honey. And you keep doing it till you've finished your onion or until your, your jar is full. And you let that sit for 24 hours. In 24 hours, you will find an amber fluid with onion floating in it. And that's your onion syrup. And what you would do then is you'd strain the onion out and there you've got your onion syrup. Now the sky's the limit as to what you do with that. You could put ginger in, you could put garlic in as well and it's actually quite nice one lady said how long does it last I said not long in my house when I had children it's quite nice and of course there's no limit on that you know often cough mixtures there's a limit on how much you can take but not with the onion maybe you would give it to a child a half a teaspoon three times a day and maybe for adult a teaspoon three times a day if a child's coughing at night, you might give them a little bit. You could give them a little, a little every half hour. But if a child has a cold and an adult has a cold, one of the easiest ways to stop nighttime coughing is to have a main meal at breakfast and lunch and not have an evening meal. Most people cough at night when they've got a lot of food into their stomach. Another simple treatment is if someone's coughing a lot is put a crystal of Celtic salt on the tongue and drink down a glass of water. And um, that really relieves the coughing. Yeah? Um, Barbara, does that help with whooping cough? Does that help with whooping cough? It absolutely can help with whooping cough. But some, this is a very old remedy for whooping cough. And remember, whooping cough, the Chinese call it the 100 day cough. So for 100 days, it's not severe for 100 days. It's often only severe maybe for oh, two or three weeks, but the, the person will cough for that long. And it's, it's just helping through that time. There are a few things you can do. The onion syrup can help. Lots of things will help. It's just um, waiting till it passes. <laughs> but this is using garlic. And garlic is a very potent antibiotic. To use it as an antibiotic, you would need to take four raw cloves a day. You could take the antibiotic sandwich, which is what I often do if I feel a sniffle coming on, a slice of sourdough toast, olive oil, and then a crushed clove of garlic on the whole slice of bread, avocado and tomato on top. Mm. Very nice. There's your antibiotic sandwich. You might have a couple of those. I remember I had a sniffle coming in a sore throat one day, and I had that for breakfast with some fruit. For lunch, I had it with a big salad and some lentils. So I had that because I don't usually eat at night. So I had that two days in a row and it was keeping my symptoms at bay. I woke up the third morning and I felt quite good, but I thought maybe I should have my antibiotic sandwich just in case. And the very thought of it, my body said, don't even think about it. So obviously my body was saying, I've had enough. <laughs> it was good, I didn't need it anymore. A lot of people say to me, I eat garlic all the time, and that's great. I think we all eat garlic all the time. But if you want to use it as an antibiotic, four raw cloves a day. Not everyone can take that, and if you can't take it, maybe you look at an alternative like your olive leaf extract, which is another excellent antibiotic. So what would you do for a baby? For a baby, 
you could slice up the onion very finely and put it in a little cloth and bind it to the bottom of their feet. And I have done this quite a lot to my little ones, which are not little ones any longer when they were little, and my, ch my daughters do it to their children. So you get a little cloth like this and a couple of slices of very finely sliced garlic. And let's just pretend that my hand is the little foot and you would bind it to the bottom of the foot. And then you put the booty on. Or if it's a toddler, then you put the shoe and sock on. It takes one minute for one drop of blood to go around the whole body. And in about two minutes, you can smell it on their breath. <laughs> I used to put it on my son James when he was a little black. He used to get a bit of bronchial things. And at the end of the day, take his shoes and socks off. And those bits of garlic were yellow and dried out like little bits of dried out leather. There was not a drop left in them. The slicing is the best because the juices release little by little. If, if you were to put slices of garlic straight onto the feet, it would blister the feet. And that's, and that's why the cloth, even though the juice comes through the cloth, it acts as a little bit of a protection. But I've met a few mothers that have blistered their baby's feet. <laughs> One lady said she heard about it, so she grated up the garlic and she said, the whole of my baby's foot is one blister. I said, that'll heal, but it's a pity you won't be able to put garlic poultice on for about a week. <laughs> But that is a very old remedy for whooping cough. What happens? Well, as soon as the garlic juice goes into the bloodstream, the body takes it where it needs it. And if there's a congested chest, it'll take it there. And it actually has the ability to loosen up a congested chest. But let me give you the recipe for a flu bomb. I think you have it in your notes, but for the sake of the, for the film, I'll give the recipe. It's called a flu bomb. It's got garlic in it. You might crush a clove of garlic. It's got ginger in it, about an eighth of a teaspoon of finely chopped ginger. It's got a teaspoon of honey. It's got the juice of a lemon. If lemons are scarce, you might do half a, half a lemon. It's got a sprinkle of cayenne pepper. For the very brave, you might do half a teaspoon. And it's got one drop of either tea tree oil or eucalyptus oil. And then you put about a third of a cup of hot water with that and you'll be surprised at what you do next, drink it. Now if, you, if someone has a bad cold coming on, it might be anything from sinus to, res, to any respiratory, head cold, flu, chest cold, pneumonia, bronchitis, asthma, bronchiolitis, and if they take the flu bomb three times a day, it will subside all the symptoms and it's rarely when you get to the third day that you will need to take anything. So that's the very powerful flu bomb. I remember a friend visited once. I hadn't seen him for a few years. He said, I've got a bit of a tickle coming on, Barbara, and he's looking at all my herbs. Make me up a mix. So I made him up a flu bomb. He never asked me for another mix again. <laughs> it's a mighty brew, but you don't have to chew the garlic. Just throw it down, and, um, and then you can uh, experience the wonders of the relief that it'll bring. Next thing we're going to look at, I'm, I'm actually not going to demonstrate this. I'm going to just talk to you about the cabbage. And every mother knows who's had a baby in hospital that the midwives give cabbage leaves. When the milk comes in and the breasts are very swollen, putting a cabbage leaf inside the bra is very, very soothing for the swollen breasts. So you can use cabbage for... Uh, swollen knees for sprained ankles and what you do is you dip a cabbage leaf into boiling water just for about a minute or you mash it up a little bit with a meat tenderizer and then you can put it around the ankle and then you might cover it with a cloth glad wrap and then bandage it on so that's one of the wonders of cabbage you can use it as a as as a anti-inflammatory for all tissue inflammation ginger Ginger's probably one of the best herbs for joint inflammation. The humble ginger is very powerful internally as an anti-nausea. I think it's probably one of the most famous for car sicknesses, sea sicknesses. 
um, for, for poor digestion, indigestion. And one of the nicest ways to make it is to grate it up on a small grater. Has everyone got one of these? Every kitchen should have this. When I'm cooking, I just get the ginger and straight into the pot and the garlic straight into the pot. It's great, then a little bit of water over it to put all the rest in. But this is excellent for making your ginger teas. You grate the ginger, put about a teaspoon into a teapot, pour the boiling water on and let it sit for approximately 10 minutes and then pour it through a strainer. It's a beautiful tea. But I'm gonna show you now how to do a ginger poultice. As I said, you can use a chuck, so you can use a sheet, and you grate it. Now when I say you use it for joint inflammation, you could use that for arthritis, you could use it for an aching back, anywhere where you've got joint inflammation, you use the ginger. And you just spread it out a little bit. You can almost spread it like you'd spread peanut butter, as you can see, as you can see by that. And then you pull your cloth over and back and back. And there's your ginger poultice. Now you can see the, the moisture coming out. It's actually quite wet. And you would cover the back of that with plastic. You might put it on any swollen joint at all. If your joint is inflamed and you put the ginger poultice on, the skin will get very hot as if the skin is burning, but it will never burn. It just feels hot. And what's happening is the ginger is pulling the heat out of the joint and to the skin. So you might say, I can't bear this poultice on anymore. My skin feels like it's burning. You might say, yeah, 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 but what's your joint like? <laughs> and because the skin's burning so much, you almost think, you almost forget, oh, that I did have a painful joint. I had a very sore back not long ago. It was a combination of a lot of traveling and gardening, etc., etc. And I could hardly sleep this night. I'd gone to sleep okay, but I tossed and tossed. Three in the morning, I could not get a comfortable position. So I got up and made a ginger poultice. Now you can see that took me minutes to make. And then what I did was I put it on my lower back and then I bandaged it around and then I laid in bed and I laid with my knees in the air and my feet flat so that my lower back was flat straight onto the poultice. And I think it was probably about five or six minutes and I could feel the heat coming out. Now if my back was not inflamed, no heat would have come out. Now what that heat did, the heat coming out lowered and reduced the inflammation in my spine and most pain is due to inflammation so if you can get the inflammation down you can reduce the pain now whenever there's pain the muscles tighten against the pain and the heat was relaxing the muscles and i just fell straight to sleep it probably only took me about seven minutes before i felt that relief and i was asleep in the morning it i didn't have quite as much pain the floods were up at the time and finally we were able to get out and I went to see an osteopath and he did a little bit of adjustment. He said, I can't do much, you are so inflamed. He said, would you consider anti-inflammatories? I said, no, but I said, in my bag, I've got my grater, I've got my ginger, <laughs> I've got some cloths and a plastic. And he looked at me and I said, I'll make a poultice and I'll put it on and it will bring me a lot of relief. Mm. He was amazed. And it does. And it was only probably a few days. Maybe I did it twice a day. I just did it whenever I needed and I knew it would bring me relief. If ever I have pain, the last thing in my mind is, is um, pain-killing medication. I just, why is my pain there? And then I'll do some sort of poultice or hydrotherapy treatment to bring relief. And it always does. So that's what you would use for your joint inflammation. Yes, question. Um, does that Does that mean it would disperse fluid in the body? I guess... If around a joint. If it was around a joint, absolutely. You, as we go through this, there are a few poultices that I will be, be covering. And what you can also do is try them. Try cabbage. Try the ginger. 
Well, the other thing, which we'll move on to now, is the potato. And the potato is probably the most famous and the most powerful for all tissue inflammation. Ginger is for joint inflammation, the potato is for tissue inflammation. So where you would use your potato would be a swollen ankle, sprained ankle, any, any area where you've got swelling. In grown toenail, a lady rang me up and she said, my daughter has just trodden on a rusty nail. It was, and it almost went through the top of her foot. She said, I've heard about your potato poultice and I'm putting it on, but it's still a little red and it's sore. So I said to her, what I would do is I would do the hot and colds. We talked about them the other night. Three minutes in the hot water, 30 seconds in ice cold. Three minutes in hot water, 30 seconds in ice cold. You do it three times. It's called alternating hot and cold foot baths. What that does, it brings a dramatic influx of blood into the area, which forces the old stagnant blood to be flushed out. New blood brings more nutrition, more water, more oxygen, more white blood cells, everything that that foot needs to heal. And then put the grated potato on. Now I was a little bit concerned about the situation, so I said, please ring me in an hour and tell me what's happening. She rang me in two hours. I always take no news as good news. She said, the child's laughing, all the redness has gone out of the foot and all the pain is gone. Those hot and cold treatments can, can give a real boost to the, to the poultices. So to make the grated potato poultice, we grate the potato. Potato is very wet, so be careful not to, not to make it too much. So there's the potato. Spread it out a little. This is very cooling. And this potato poultice you can use in any of the tender parts of the body. Very good on sore eyes, very good for conjunctivitis, and you can see that's quite wet. A friend of mine rang me up when, I, when my children were young, and her children were little too, and she had a little baby, and I could hear the little baby screaming. I said, what's the matter with Louie? She said, I don't know why, but she said his little penis, he's only 10 months old, is twice the size. What are you going to do? And if you take him to hospital, what are they going to do? I said, quickly made a grated potato poultice. That only took me minutes. I said, put the grated potato poultice over his whole scrotum. See, that's very cold, but that would be very cooling. Potato is high in potassium and phosphorus, which are absorbed by, through the skin into the body and helps with the healing. I said, put that over the area, put his nappy on. So she did. And she told me that he stopped crying within, a, within about five minutes. The little bloke was also exhausted. He slept for two hours. She kept going into the bedroom to check. What does a two hour sleep mean for a baby? It means that he's out of pain. When he woke, she took the nappy off and everything was back to normal. Now sometimes you don't know, a little baby crawling around, it could have been a bite, it could have been a little bit of dirt got in, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know what's causing the swelling and you actually don't have to know. Because if you put the grated potato poultice on and it brings relief, the body's saying what? Well, good, this, this is helping me. One of the most dramatic responses to this I've seen was when I was living in the rainforest, we had a guy living on our property who was a real hippie. And he used to live in the caravan and he would sickle the grass, you know, the old fashioned sickle in bare feet. He was doing it one day and one of the guys told me that the end of the sickle went into his ankle. I didn't hear anything again for about three days. And three days later, one of the guys of you said, have you seen Chris? His, his foot's up like a big red balloon and there's a big red line going up his leg and Chris was lying in bed smoking marijuana waiting for nature to heal. Nature will heal if you give it the right conditions. And sadly, 
The dope was actually putting him in la la land. His body was screaming at him, but he wasn't listening to it because he kept dulling the pain with the marijuana. You see, your body speaks to you, doesn't it? I said, bring him up. So they brought him up. He couldn't walk. And what I did was I did hot and cold. So I thought, this, this is a crisis. We've got to move quickly on this one. Now, I knew that he would not be able to handle really hot water. I always put the person's foot into my hand, lower it carefully into the water and watch their face. Because it was so painful, I, I made it just probably body temperature. And then after three minutes, I put it in the ice cold. After the ice cold, he could handle a little bit more hot. And I did that three times. That treatment alone reduced his pain by about 40%. You see, the blood was sitting and pooling there. So going alternating hot and cold brings a dramatic flow of blood, pushes the old blood out. It's been used for centuries, hydrotherapy, and in the area of pain relief, there really is no equal. And it's dramatic. How long did that take? 15 minutes, and we got some dramatic results. The swelling went down a little. And then I put a grated potato poultice not just on the site, but on his whole foot. So big grated potato poultice. I wanted that tissue swelling to get right down. And then I put Glad Wrap all over it. His pain levels, by the time the hot and coals had been done and the grated potato had been done, had reduced about 50%. He could actually even limp a little bit now. I said, come back in two hours. When he came back in two hours, the swelling had gone down by half and the wound had opened. See, this was a deep wound and it must not close until it healed from the very mi middle. In fact, that wound must stay open until it healed right from the middle. Tetanus can only get a hold on a body if it's a deep wound that heals on the outside and there's an element of horse organism in the soil. So we had it all. And tetanus is a nasty death. Now, if he'd come back in two hours and I hadn't seen results, we would have just taken him straight to hospital. But I was seeing results. I did it again, the hot and coals again. I did the grated potato again. I saw it come down a little bit more. He came back two hours later. The red line was starting to go down. The, foot had, the swelling in the foot had gone down by nearly three quarters. I think I did it another two hours. So I did it three times, two hours apart. And by then it was evening and I said, come back in the morning. When he came back in the morning, the red line had gone, traveled down by half. The foot was now its normal size and the wound was oozing nicely. Dramatic results. And all we did was hot and coals and grated potato. So very dramatic, very simple though. You would never put an onion poultice on the eye, but that's where you use your grated potato. You would never put a ginger poultice on the eye, but you would put it a potato. So any tender parts of the body, you would put a grated potato. The next thing we're going to look at is charcoal. Charcoal is out on its own. It is not a herb, it is not a plant. It is just burnt wood. And the most powerful charcoal is burnt softwoods or burnt coconut shells. When I lived in the rainforest and the children were little, I just used to get the charcoal out of the fire and I'd blend it up. But you don't take the lid off the blender for about an hour or you'll get black dust everywhere. But now I buy activated charcoal, which is a little bit more powerful, but the, the charcoal out of your fire will do the same thing. Now charcoal can be used internally and it can be used externally. Internally, it's, it's used in hospitals today for poisoning because charcoal has the ability not only to absorb, it is a drawer, not only to absorb but to neutralize poisons. And that's why they use it in hospital. Because if a person's had an overdose or taken something that's poisoning them and they take a dose of charcoal, it will absorb the poison and neutralize the poison so it can no longer harm them. So you can use it for poisoning, you can use it for diarrhea, you can use it for nausea. A lot of people that travel overseas will take charcoal with them in case they get a touch of um, gastric overseas. 
but you can also use it externally. And externally, you would use it again for all cases of poisoning. So you would use it for uh, bee stings, ant bites, wasp bites, uh, ticks, um, snake bites, leeches. You would use it for all of those areas. Now, when someone is bitten like that, you could consider it's a bit of a crisis and you've got to move fast. So I'm going to show you something that we have been doing recently with our charcoal to show you how you can make it in a form that's very easy accessible. And to do this, I'm going to mix the charcoal with psyllium. And by mixing it with psyllium, I'm making it in like a jelly. To do this, the recipe is one part psyllium. So I've got one teaspoon of psyllium there and three parts charcoal. So one part psyllium and three parts charcoal. That's about a one and a half and that's about a one and a half. So that would be about one part psyllium, three parts charcoal. And then you add enough water to make a soft jelly. Mix that round a little bit before you put the water in. If you mix charcoal with water, it's like mixing dirt with water. It, it doesn't mix very well. Whereas the psyllium causes it to mix up like a soft jelly. And when I have made this little mix, then I'm going to roll it out between two sheets of glad wrap. And you will see how I do that. And then I've got strips of this fine jelly. And then you can just keep that in the fridge. You can just cut it into the size you need. So if someone, if the cry goes out that a, a person's been bitten by a snake or a bee or a jumping ant or a wasp, you can run inside, go to your fridge and just cut to size the bit that you need. I think every household should have this in their, in their fridge. So you get two pieces of glad wrap. So as you can see now it's like a lump of jelly. That's what the psyllium does. Another piece of glad wrap on top of that. And then you roll it with a rolling pin. Now you can make five times this if you like. And that's it. You see it? And then you might cut that in half and put it in little snap block bags in the fridge. Then the cry goes out, someone's been bitten by a bee. You run to the fridge, you just cut to size. See, you could almost just, see how you can just cut it? You just cut the size you need and then you take off the top the top glad, the top, uh, this is still a bit sticky because I've just made it. So you take up the top glad wrap and then you would put that straight onto the whatever, snake bite, bee sting, and then you just tape it on. How quick is that? So it can just be in the fridge. So we've just started doing this and it's great because someone gets a bee sting, hang on. You might say, I'll just get the bowl and I'll just find the charcoal and then I'll just, can you see you've got minutes and someone's, <laughs> someone's in pain. So that's, that's just a very easy way to make your charcoal yeah. poultices. So what we'll do is we'll put that in the fridge. It gets a little bit firmer when it's been in the fridge for a while and it's just very easy accessible, yes? How long does it last? That would last 
probably last about a month. So if you think you're not going to use it, you could always keep it in the freezer. Because if someone's got a bite, something that's very cold is very nice. We had um, one of our girls recently, um, she had a leech bite on her calf and it got quite infected. It was quite big and quite red. And she told me that she had a swelling in her, in her groin and I had a look and she had a red line coming down here and a lump in there. And I said, I'm not sure what that would be. So we went through a few things and I said, maybe put your feet up a little bit, maybe take some lymphatic herbs. Anyway, the next day, one of the girls said, have you seen it today? It's far worse. And I followed the line down and I followed it down and guess where it ended? <laughs> I said, aha, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the leech bite. And so she, I think she did that overnight. Then she did it probably for two four hour spots in the day. And little by little, all the swelling came down. You see that had got infected and it was running up the lymph line. So you've got to go to that source. So charcoal, excellent for all bee stings, snake bites, wasp bites. You'd be amazed as soon as that charcoal goes on, the pain goes. It's quite phenomenal how quickly the pain goes as soon as the charcoal's on. Castor oil. Castor oil is a very thick, gooey oil. And I don't suggest you take castor oil by mouth. Castor oil, I think, should only be used on the outside. Castor oil can penetrate deeper than any other oil and wherever castor oil is applied it penetrates very deep into the body. No other oil will do that. And wherever, wherever castor oil penetrates it breaks up lumps, bumps, adhesions, it'll break down a bone spur. If the bone spur has been there for three years it might take three months of application. If the bone spur has been there three months, it might take three weeks. If the bone spur has been there three weeks, it might take three days. Now what you do, this is a compress, not a poultice. And as a compress, you make a thick compress so that it can hold that castor oil. And you can keep reusing the compress because it's not drawing anything into it. I've made one up here, which is how we usually do it. We cut a bluey an incontinence pad in four and then we slip a towel in there, a piece of old towel and then we tape it up. You see the thicker you compress the more castor oil it can hold and then the more castor oil is available to go into you. At first I would put about that much castor oil on and then I would just sit it for a while. It takes about half an hour to soak right in and as soon as it's placed on the body the body heat will warm that oil and it'll spread out. So if you covered this whole thing with castor oil and put it on the body, by the time the body warmed it up, you'd have dripping castor oil, which is no fun. And a little pad like this is very handy because plastic on the outside means it's not going to soil the clothes and it keeps it from chilling. Now this is an excellent size for the abdominal area. And why would you use it on the abdominal area? You would use it for constipation. It'll penetrate deep and break up the congestion. You would use it for irritable bowel. Irritable bowel is irritation of the lining of the gastrointestinal tract in the colon area and it will bring healing and soothing to that area. I met a lady who was a doctor's wife who had irritable bowel. She said, I decided not to go the medical way. She said, I heard about this old remedy of castor oil. So she said, I made castor oil packs. And she said, I slept with them every night. She said, sometimes I'd wear them for a few hours every day. And she said, I healed my irritable bowel. You might put it on that area if a woman has fibroids in the uterus. It, little by little, it will break them down. Now. If the fibroid is so large that it's starting to block off the colon, surgery may be necessary. But what I say if a woman says, well, I don't know, I say, well, give this a go. See how it feels. One young girl I know did it, and within a month, her fibroid had halved. What's the body saying? We can do it with the castor oil. 
One lady rang me up and I told her what to do and she rang me a day later. She said, I'm not able to go to the toilet, you know. And I said, maybe the fibroid is, you know, maybe you need to have some surgery because if the fibroid gets so big and starts blocking up our organs. So ideally, we get to it before it gets too big. Uh, cysts on the ovaries, it will certainly break those down. Um, under the rib is the liver and underneath the liver is the gallbladder. So for gallstones, you might not need one this big, you might need one only that big to put under for the gallstones. On the back for, the, for kidney stones, you could put it anywhere where there are bone spurs. The good news is it won't break down your bone. It'll only break down those calcium deposits that build up on the bone. I've known people to put it on their chest for a congested chest. Put it on the chest, then put a hot water bottle on. So that's the castor oil. I've also known people to use it for brain tumours, for different types of tumours, and little by little it can break the tumour down. Like the dripping tap on a stone, that's how you remember. Now after about two weeks, it might, the, the, the compress might be looking a little sad, then you can cast it away and make another one. Maybe every second day you might put another teaspoon of castor oil on. You'll get to know how much you need. But the castor oil can be an excellent part of a program when endeavouring to conquer various Ill ailments in the body. Cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper is a very powerful herb and cayenne pepper moves blood. Cayenne pepper can be used internally and it can be used externally. The easiest way to take cayenne pepper internally is to start with about a quarter of a teaspoon, put it in a cup, add water, mix it round and just drink it down. It'll tingle for a bit, but the tingling subsides. I find most people can build up to half a teaspoon. Why would someone take cayenne pepper like that? Cayenne pepper thins the blood. I know several people that have chosen to stop Wolfrin and their blood thinning medication and go on the cayenne pepper. And one, one lady told me that her, that her husband went to the doctor and he said, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. <laughs> because the cayenne pepper was keeping that blood nice and thin. No side effects to the cayenne pepper either. Cayenne pepper thins the blood. Cayenne pepper strengthens the arterial walls. Cayenne pepper, I was reading, has also the ability to rebuild the heart muscle. A lady I tended one day because she just had a heart attack. It was at our health retreat in Melbourne. I was given the call. A lady's had a heart attack. I went running down and her husband was there. He said she's already had three this year. She was 80. When I looked at her, she was very pale. There was a man holding a pulse. He said, the pulse is almost gone. I said, quick, cane pepper. I got about half a teaspoon, just put it straight into her mouth. I'd say two minutes. And the guy holding a pulse, he yelled out, the pulse is strong. In 92 minutes, all the blood came back to her face. She blinked and sat up. We gave her a glass of water. She said she didn't even feel the heat in her mouth. What did that cane pepper do? It immediately thinned the blood it opened all of those capillaries and got a dramatic delivery of blood all through the body. When you think about it, one minute for one drop of blood to go around the whole body. You have glands under your tongue called sublingual glands and it can take it straight into the blood. So it's very dramatic. You might use cayenne pepper internally for low hydrochloric acid. It'll wake anything up. Jethro Kloss in his book, Back to Eden, he spends 10 pages on cayenne pepper, half a page to every other herb. He also talks about putting cayenne pepper with other herbs to increase the delivery of that herb. You see, cayenne pepper moves blood. And remember, your blood is your river of life. It's the healer in the body. You can also use it internally for an upset stomach. It'll relieve that. You can use it to heal an ulcer. You see, cayenne pepper never irritates. Black pepper irritates. Chili pepper can irritate, but not cayenne pepper. It'll heal a stomach ulcer. You can use cayenne pepper externally. If someone has a cut, you can sprinkle the cayenne pepper on 
and it'll cause all the blood vessels to seal shut. So internally, it'll open them, but if it comes to any bleeding part, it'll seal it shut. Remember what I said this morning, your herbs are synergistic. It means that they work with the needs of the body. My son William got quite a nasty cut across three fingers by a banana knife. It was dusk, light wasn't good. Big brother Peter was chopping them. William was coming in and taking the old banana stalks away. He thought Peter had stopped in that area, came in the night anyway. We sprinkled cayenne pepper in it. Actually, I wasn't there. The kids were there. They did it. <laughs> they knew what to do. He's got quite a mighty scar there. And I know they would have stitched it if he'd gone to hospital, but the cayenne pepper drew it together nicely. Now, this little finger was bent for a while. That means that it had cut through a tendon. But I massaged that for a while, and after a few days, it was working together again. It's almost the first aid kit in one. In fact, if you had your charcoal and your cane pepper, you've just about got your first aid kit, haven't you? Cane pepper can also be used externally to get blood to the area. We had a lady do our program. Well, she actually rang me first. She said, I have no feeling in my feet. Can you help me? She said, I'm a diabetic. I said, absolutely. When she came to our retreat, she couldn't feel her feet. Very difficult to walk. She was a diabetic in her 70s. So every night I got the staff to massage her feet for just even just five minutes. And then we, you cannot do hot and cold foot treatments on a diabetic because they can't feel and you could burn the tissues. So we did warm and cool. She couldn't feel the difference. And then we made a cane pepper poultice for the bottom of her feet. And I'll show you how we did it. So you get glad wrap and you get some kitchen paper folded in half. That's approximately the size of a foot. And then you very lightly just sprinkle a little cut, a little olive oil on it. Not very much. You spread the olive oil out. The olive oil is just there so that the cayenne pepper will stick to it. And then you put the cayenne on. You could easily do about a half a teaspoon to each foot. So this is for one foot and you definitely would do both feet. So you see I've, I've generously sprinkled that with cayenne pepper. You put the foot on and then you put the glad wrap over it and put a sock on. That's all you do. The, the foot goes straight on to there. Now most people will not experience warmth till the morning. And I knew with this lady, I knew it would be several days before she experienced warmth. Mm -hmm. So you can't do hot and colds to someone who has no feeling in their feet, but you can do that. So every day she started to get a bit more feeling and the first thing she experienced was pins and needles. Mm -hmm. Now if you or I had that on overnight, by morning our feet would be very hot. And we definitely would not want another one the next night. Otherwise, we'd want our feet in ice water all day. But not with this lady. By the end of the week, she didn't say very much. She sent me a card six weeks later. And she wrote to me and she said, I just want to tell you that the feeling in my feet is phenomenal. See, with her, I advise doing that about three times a week. She said, the people in the village where I'm living are calling me the miracle lady. She said, they saw how I used to hobble along before and they see me walking well. She said, I have, I'm continuing with the treatments. I get a lady to come in twice a week to massage my feet and my legs. She said, I'm keeping to the dietary guidelines. And, and I think she told me she'd lost something like six kilos. That's after six weeks. And her insulin levels had come, her um, insulin, what she was taking, she'd reduced by two thirds. That's quite phenomenal, isn't it? So you could use it for people that have no feeling in their feet. A few programs ago, we had two ladies that have constantly cold feet. So we did the cane pepper poultices on the bottom of their feet. Very easy, foot on, sock on over that. And in mo by morning, their feet were warm and they were very excited. They finally had warm feet. You see, perfect health requires perfect circulation. We should never have cold feet. If you get cold feet, you, you've got to do something. And if you put a very cold feet and hot water, it can be very painful. 
If your feet are very cold, you're going to put them in warm water. And then as slowly as your feet warm up, you can put a little bit more warm in. You could put a cayenne pepper poultice on an underactive thyroid gland. That'll wake it up. If the thyroid gland's overactive, put ice on it. That'll slow it down. Can you see how simple it can be? I said this one evening in the poultice lecture and the next night we had a, one of the guests who had an underactive thyroid gland, she said to the staff, I think I'll try that cane pepper on my thyroid gland tonight. Well, in the morning I said, oh, you put it on in the night. How was your night? She said, I couldn't sleep all night. <laughs> I said, well, the good news is it worked. The bad news is you, you didn't sleep. <laughs> Moral of story, don't put it on at night. <laughs> It'll wake anything up. We had a guy do our program, he was in his 80s and he had only had one leg because it had been taken off because the circulation was so bad he'd start to go gangrene and the other leg was cold and losing its feeling. So we wrapped his whole leg in cane pepper. He kept his leg. We brought feeling back into the leg. You'll never look at cane pepper again the same, will you? <laughs> and you can just wrap it up and keep it like that. But in the morning, just throw it away. That's a very easy one. And again, you do both feet. You can also do a cane pepper poultice on the bottom of a feet if you feel a cold coming on. I was travelling, oh, about two years ago, I was doing meetings in Albury and I got there Friday night and when I got to my friend's house Friday night I had a sore throat, I could feel sniffles coming on and I was going to be lecturing, supposed to be lecturing all day Saturday. So I went to bed with cane pepper poultices on the bottom of my feet, I had an onion poultice on my throat and I took cane pepper in water and I went to bed. <laughs> I woke up in the morning, throat didn't feel too bad, had a great big glass of water um, took the cane pepper poultices off my feet, wiped my feet. Why did I put them on my feet? Your feet are a reflex for your head, for your chest and for your abdominal area. So for a head cold you can put cane pepper poultices on your feet, it will, it will help. I went for a jog, my morning walk, came back, had my hot and cold shower, no creek to dive in there. I had a couple of antibiotic sandwiches for breakfast and a plate of fruit and I lectured all day with no sore throat and no sniffle. Very nice to know what you can do, isn't it? The last thing we're going to look at is slippery elm. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree and you can see by looking at the way it just moves in this glass. It just looks like the powdered bark of a tree. But when you put it with water, it goes like soft jelly. So often if I'm making a, cane pe sorry, a charcoal poultice from scratch, I'll do half-half. You see, slippery elm is also a drawer. And you can put a charcoal and slippery elm poultice on any bee stings, bites. You could even put it on a congested chest. Remember what I said about charcoal? It's like mixing dirt and water. But if you put the slippery elm with it, it goes like a soft jelly similar to the psyllium. But the beauty of doing it with slippery elm, it is, it is also a drawer. Psyllium is about a sixth the price of slippery elm. <laughs> so slippery elm can be used externally as a drawer and it can be used internally. It goes like a soft jelly when you put it with water. It almost is a bit like, dare I say, mucus. So when you take it by mouth, it coats and soothes the whole of the gastrointestinal tract. It'll soothe a sore throat. It'll soothe ulcerated esophagus. It'll soothe an ulcerated stomach. It will heal a stomach ulcer. Let's go further down into the small intestine and into the colon. It'll heal Crohn's disease. It'll heal irritable bowel. What slippery elm has, it has a growth stimulant in it. So it stimulates rapid healing in the gastrointestinal tract. I have to tell you the story of Roy because this is quite remarkable. He had a very sore stomach. He said, I've tried everything to heal my stomach and, and nothing helps. He said, I went to the doctor and they gave me Nexium to slow down the stomach acid. He said, it didn't help, so then they sent me to the psychiatrist. So I said, stay there. I mixed up some slippery on with water. I said, take this. He said, oh. <laughs> 
That's taken the pain out somewhat. Every day I gave him a big teaspoon of slippery elm in a big cup of water. Have to mix it quickly and throw it down because it can go quite thick and some people are a bit challenged by the thickness of it. But just imagine what that's doing inside. When I gave the lecture on Wednesday night on the poultices, he said, it's helping me. He was about 35. On the last day, I said to him, how is it? He said, my pain levels are now 2 out of 10. I said, what were they on Sunday on your first day? He said, 15 out of 10. He said, I've just been living with it. He said, it's terrible. I can't drink alcohol. I can't eat meat. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> He'd actually come to a very austere diet. But he was very excited because he could eat everything we had here. Obviously, we were giving him food that helped. But we were also, this was causing healing. He just said, this has become my best friend. <laughs> he said, midweek, it was down to 5 out of 10. So it was just so nice to see this man's life turned around. Mm -hmm. He said, I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I'm just in constant pain. And they were sending him to the psychiatrist. See, constant pain certainly can cause a person to get very, very down when all he needed was something to cause healing in that gastrointestinal tract. So slippery elms are a fantastic herb to use internally and externally. If someone has diarrhea and you give them this, it will slow everything down and it will heal it. Last but certainly not least is aloe vera. Most homes have aloe vera. If they don't, they should. <laughs> aloe vera also contains a growth stimulant. So aloe vera can also be taken internally to coat and soothe and heal the gastrointestinal tract. Do you know that Crohn's, irritable bowel, ulcers, do you know they're the easiest things to heal? Because the because the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, they're remade every three to five days. What you've got to do is stop, stop irritating it. And the most common irritants are refined sugar, your dairy products and gluten products. Put the person on slippery elm or aloe vera three times a day and it's amazing how quickly they heal. But aloe vera can also be used externally. It can be used for all skin problems. Very simple way to take it is to just cut a leaf, peel it heavily because that thick yellow slime just under the skin can be an irritant to the colon and cause someone to have diarrhea. And you can, it's just like eating nothing and just chew it up or put it in your, in your juicer. There's some quick ways to do it because the aloe vera can heal internally and it can heal externally. I think most people are aware of the wonders of aloe vera on burns. Mm. Michael recently burnt three layers down on his finger. He never comes to me when he hurts himself. He did this day. <laughs> I soaked it in Epsom salt water for a while and he kept saying, I've got to get back to work. And so then I cut the tip off an aloe vera plant. I kept one side of skin on and cut the front side skin off and just put that straight on with a bit of tape. And you look at his finger now and you, he burnt through right down to the flesh and you would not think that anything had ever happened to that skin. I think that they would have done a skin graft on him if he'd gone to hospital. Aloe vera is fantastic for the burns. That's why every home should have one. It's very easy. Cut the leaf, split it, put it straight onto the burn with the skin intact and then it won't dry out. I trust this lecture has been interesting for you, ladies and gentlemen, with all these little bits and pieces that you can do to the body to stimulate a healing response and get that healing happening even quicker. Thank you. Mm -hmm.